Hi friends, welcome to Talking Heads of Atascacita. My name is Amy Bridwell and I am on the phone with Monsignor James Golazinski. Monsignor, last week's gospel reading, Jesus rebuked Peter. Do you have commentary on that? Well, most people remember what our Lord said to Peter, uh, get behind me, Satan. Yes. But most people uh, aren't uh, familiar, or I don't remember what our Lord didn't proceed to say to Peter. You think the thoughts of man, not the thoughts of God. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people today who think the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many troubles. So let us begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And direct us, O Lord, in all our actions, that every work and prayer may begin with thee, and through thee be successfully completed, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And St. Robert Bellarmine. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. He's a doctor of the church. Oh, I didn't and know that. Mm -hmm. If you ever go to Rome, go to the church named after uh, St. Francis Xavier. And in the side altar, St. Robert Bellarmine's body is, uh, is preserved. Oh, wonderful. And St. Robert Bellarmine is a doctor of the church mm -hmm. because he was an extremely intelligent doctor of living. That's why we call these people doctors of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, the word doctor originally meant a teacher, didn't it? Yes. It comes, it comes from the Latin word, verb docere, which means to teach. Mm -hmm. And anyway, why do we call these people? Uh, we, why do we call them doctors? Why do we give them this, this, this title of doctor? Because mm -hmm. uh, in their lifetimes, and even now, uh, they were they have and are preeminent teachers of life. Uh, let us deal with a very very burning issue, and it's going to be burning and burning and burning for a long time. And I'm talking about our Texas law, the living heartbeat. That's what we call it, don't we? Living the heart, heartbeat. Yeah, the heartbeat law. Yes. Oh, heartbeat law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heartbeat law. Mm -hmm. It's going to be around for a long time because. Uh, this is going to be a major battle in, in this cultural war. Yes. People uh, and groups and all uh, around the world you know, are lining up to, to uh, fight uh, fight our state over mm -hmm. this state law. Mm -hmm. And uh, our president was uh, asked to comment on uh, our state law, and uh, he gave an interview give an answer that was actually irrelevant. He said something about he thinks, he doesn't agree that life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. Well, that isn't what the, what the law is about. Mm -hmm. the, the law is about when the, the heart starts to beat. Mm -hmm. And Cardinal Gregory, uh, later he's on a panel at the National Press Club, was, was asked about that. And Cardinal Gregory said, well, uh, the president was in conflict with Catholic teaching. Mm -hmm. And I just hate for people in, in positions like this to give that kind of answer. Mm -hmm. uh, back when Paul Ryan was Mitt Romney's running mate during the vice presidential nomination, uh, he was asked about abortion and he brought up his religion, his religion. Mm -hmm. It's not a question, not a question of our religion. Mm -hmm. huh? It's not mm -hmm. a question of our religion. That's right. It's a question of a biological fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, to uh, our, for our spokesman, whether in hierarchy or in uh, civil society, to be talking about our religion, my religion, and so forth, is to muddy the water. Mm -hmm. I mean... Does that mean that this is some, is some kind of Catholic rule? Well, that's how the media and so many other people take it and run with it. Right. And make this, you know, make these into Catholic issues. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the, the, the back, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, support of uh, keep your rosaries over my ov off of my ovaries? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, 
That's right. Well, you yes. Catholics are trying to do something. You Catholics are trying to do something. Mm-hmm. What about the Mormons? Mm-hmm. Oh, what about the uh, the Jews in uh, New York City? The city, the city Jews. Mm-hmm. Every year at March for Life in Washington, huh? mm-hmm. we have uh, a rabbi huh? who uh, speaks, and sometimes they're really, really uh, powerful. Mm-hmm. I remember. Uh, being at one, and uh, this prominent rabbi from New York City named Yehuda Levin, and he was speaking you know, to the crowd, you know, 100,000 plus people, and we were right behind the White House, and Clinton had taken office, and anyway, being uh, uh, a Jewish rabbi, he takes a sort of a Jewish approach, he tells the story of Moses, he tells us how, how Pharaoh uh, Pharaoh tried to do away with all of those mm-hmm. Jewish boys. Right. And, <laughs> and then, uh, from that point onward, then he, he over the PA uh, uh, system, he addressed this, the newly installed uh, President Clinton. And <laughs> from that time on, he, he would just, he, would, he wouldn't just say President Clinton, he would say, Fair President Clinton. Mm-hmm. Fair President, mm-hmm. Pharaoh mm-hmm. President Clinton. I gotcha. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, when our people talk about this is not uh, our religion, all they're doing is just adding confusion Mm -hmm. to the issue. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're not in conflict, uh, not in conflict, because uh, this is a Catholic rule, because our way of life is in sync with reality. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something interesting here uh, that is from the next to the most recent issue of the uh, National Catholic Registry. It has to do with with what's going on, but also in connection with the Mississippi decision that is going to be given uh, very, very soon. And that is called the Dobbs case. Mm -hmm. And Anyway, what happened? Let me, let me back up a little bit. One of the one of the influences back in 1973 was the idea: well, no one knows when life begins. I don't know if you. Are you what year were you born? I forgot. 1970. So you were only three years old. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Justice Blackman was the one who wrote that decision. Mm-hmm. And he was from Minnesota. And in uh, his preparation for uh, fighting the decision, mm-hmm. uh, he went to the Mayo Clinic in uh, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And the result of that was he said that uh, people couldn't tell him when life begins. Mm-hmm. And so if we don't know when life begins, well, <laughs> it's all murky. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened then was there uh, was the legal counsel for NARAL. Huh? Mm-hmm. NARAL in those days meant National Abortion Rights Action League. Mm-hmm. And it was started by these uh, Jewish people in New York. Mm-hmm. And Bernard Nathanson, huh, who yes. died a Catholic, he described all of it. He writes about all the manipulation, mm-hmm. and uh, the name of the book is uh, Aborting America, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a historical uh, historical work. And anyway, I didn't know until I read this article in the National Catholic Register that there was a man uh, named Cyril Means, M-E-A-N-S, who was the general counsel for Nero. And Means wrote an amicus uh, courier. Uh, and he wrote that the laws, that the state laws that Roe versus Wade struck down were laws that were enacted in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. And the purpose of those laws was not to protect an unborn child. Mm-hmm. The purpose of those laws was to save 
safeguard women from making mistakes about themselves because in those days, uh, abortion was very, very, very dangerous mm -hmm. for the lives and the health of, uh, of, of the expectant mother. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I, I never, never heard about that until reading this article. And uh, it, it quotes uh, something written by Robbie George. Uh, means, quote, claims to show that abortion was actually a, a liberty in common law prior mm -hmm. until those laws being passed mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And that the purposes of the 19th century statutes, like the Texas statute, struck down the rule that prohibited abortion, was not to protect life, the unborn child, uh, from a lethal assault, but was rather to protect women. Mm -hmm. against a dangerous surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was a, it was a lie. Mm -hmm. And Robbie George, who uh, found out about this, he said, uh, his conclusions strain credibility mm -hmm. and fudge the history, but preserve the guise of impartial scholarship while advancing the proper ideological goals, unquote. Mm. Uh, then there, uh, there are quotations here. For example, in 1866, the 14th Amendment was passed. Uh, what was the 14th Amendment uh, about? Remember, it was the amendment to the Constitution following the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The end of the Civil War was 1865, and this is a uh, now the next year, you see, prior people who were born in slavery were not persons in law. They were mm -hmm. they were cattle. They were property. Mm -hmm. And so, what the, what the Fourteenth Amendment did was it amended the Constitution and it clarified the status of the uh, newly emancipated black people mm -hmm. who were born into slavery. Mm -hmm. Then. That's what that's the purpose of what those those laws were, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of information here about how even before before the Fourteenth uh, Amendment and, and those laws that were passed in the state legislatures uh, prohibiting abortion. Here's a, a quotation from Wharton's Criminal Law, a prominent reference work on criminal law. Its first edition was 1846. Mm. It argued that the criminal law of offenses against unborn persons should be aligned with the law of property, guardianship, and equity as, uh, as uh, expounded in cases such as Hall versus Hancock, adopting authoritative English equity precedents which recognize unborn rights at all stages of development. Huh? Hmm. That's and uh, mm -hmm. let's see, here's... 30 of the 37 states, at the end of the Civil War, there were 37 states. Mm -hmm. And 30 of the 37 states explicitly criminalized abortion mm -hmm. by statute, mm -hmm. by law. Yes, I did not know that. I did not know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leading 18th century English cases later em embraced in authoritative American precedents decades before ratification of the 14th Amendment declared the general principle that unborn humans are rights-bearing persons from conception. Mm. The American Medical Association in 1859 stated the fiction that the fetus, and they have the old spelling, F-O-E-T-U-S, mm -hmm. is not alive until after the period of quickening. Hmm. That's when a mother could feel the motion of the mm -hmm. child. That was a quickening man. Okay. And urge correction, urge correction of any defects of our laws, both common law and, and uh, statute, as regards the independent and actual existence of the child before birth, a living being. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this this contention of this uh, Cyril Means, the lawyer for NARAL, uh, that the purpose of the state laws that were struck down, state laws that went back to the middle of the of the nineteenth century, it was all it was a lie. Mm -hmm. 
if you look at the history, uh, people, authoritative uh, people, uh, they uh, regarded the life of the unborn as a person. Mm-hmm. And those laws were, were not designed to protect women. Mm-hmm. They were to protect the unborn. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we stop and think about it. Uh, we now have something more authoritative. We have DNA. We certainly They didn't do. have DNA. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens at conception? At conception, it comes into existence a being, mm-hmm. uh, a being that has never existed before mm-hmm. and a being that will never exist again. Unrepeatable. I mean, yes. You and I, when we were conceived, mm-hmm. we came into uh, this universe mm-hmm. a completely unique entity. Never mm-hmm. has there been anyone like a, like us. Never will there be another one like us. Right. Mm-hmm. This is what how DNA shows to us. Mm-hmm. So even though that's what we have now is, is DNA, and, and that should be, be even stronger evidence that of, of what we're talking about is mm-hmm. uh, a, a a human person. Yes. I mean, the DNA of, of a dog is a what? Is a dog, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The DNA of a horse is mm-hmm. what? It's a horse, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The DNA of a human being is mm-hmm. then what? A human being, unrepeatable. Right, right, yes. right, right. I don't know if we mentioned this before, but one of the uh, trans- translations of the Latin word, the, the word fetus is a Latin word, mm-hmm. and one of the translations is uh, offspring. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. You see, they they took they take this word fetus, and it kind of makes you think you're not talking about something human. Mm-hmm. Right. But. Uh, if the translation of the Latin word fetus is offspring, mm-hmm. what's the offspring of a dog? Mm-hmm. It's a dog, yes. It's a dog. Mm-hmm. It's already a dog, huh? Right, that's right. It's interesting, There, at one point, there was a uh, theory, and this is based upon a, a sort of an old, outdated idea of evolution. Mm-hmm. You know, you in old textbooks and it's not held anymore mm-hmm. how you have stages of life starting with simple things and the animal gets bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and bigger yes at one time there was the idea that that is what took place mm-hmm. in the mother it started off <laughs> you know like primitive primitive life and mm-hmm. then as primitive life supposedly according to Darwinian Mm-hmm. biology, mm-hmm. which nobody holds anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the way it, it worked, mm-hmm. according to Darwin. Life went through these stages, you know, advanced, evolving, huh? Yes. Simpler. Mm-hmm. And there was that one idea that that is what took place. From mm-hmm. conception onward, it wasn't, at first, human. Yes. But it was primitive life. Mm-hmm. And just as, according to outdated Darwinian uh, evolution, it passed through these stage, you know, life becoming more and more advanced, more and more advanced, and that was that theory that that, is, was, that took place, it was replicated mm-hmm. uh, during gestation. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be found in textbooks. Yeah, well, yeah, it's easy for me to say crazy because I watched all my kids on an ultrasound developing, so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you bring up an interesting point because Sandra Day O'Connor... Years ago, remember she was the first woman yes. on the Supreme Court? Yes. And uh, anyway, she made the statement that, you know, the uh, the uh, Roe v. Wade decision was on a, on a collision course with science. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because science was showing more and more and more of what had been, had been unknown. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to conclude with one thing. I, 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 I've, been, I've never read the entire Roe versus Wade decision. It came came in came about when I was in Korea, so I didn't have access to a lot of things when I was there. But recently, I read that in the decision that if there were changes showing that we would learn when life begins, that would have been an effect. Mm-hmm. In fact, 
upon the decision. Mm -hmm. And so when you tie in with what Sandra Day O'Connor wrote about the collision course, within the decision itself, there was a provision mm -hmm. for its, huh, its revision. Yes. Yes. That sounds familiar to me, too. Yes, we do need to do some work. We need to look it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tried to look it up today, but I couldn't find it. Mm-hmm. We have super scholars who are listeners, so I bet we can find out. I hope so. Hope so. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, send in the comment to you mm -hmm. so we can look it up. In the meantime, we're going to try and keep thinking the thoughts of God and not the thoughts of man. Good, good. And fear not, little flock, and it's pleased the Father to give you the kingdom. Amen. We'll see you soon, friends. And uh, Anawim, remember. No cross, no crown. Yes. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.